Hi. Sorry, everybody, for the delay. I'm not sure entirely what happened. Um, oh, and apologies for any background barking. I'm staying with my mom, and she has many dogs. We're well, all del delightful, but quite noisy. Ah, oh, cool. There's a message from the art consortium. Thank you for your patience and apologies for the delay. Cool. Um, wow, such a full house. So nice to see everybody. Awesome. Cool. I think we should get started since we're a little bit late. My name's Astrid. Welcome to the session. I would love to know where everybody is joining from. I'm joining from South Africa. If you can't tell, that's where my accent is from, um, from Johannesburg. So if you feel comfortable, please pop your location in the chat, the city that you're joining from, USA, Portland, Oregon, cool, Charlottesville, Florida, Michigan, Los Angeles. Oh, New York City is one of my favorite places in the whole world. Ah, uh, Istanbul. Hello, awesome. From New Zealand, kind of in London. Sick. Cool. So everybody seems to be experiencing morning right now. It's about 5 p.m. here. Switzerland. Awesome. Chicago. Chicago is the only musical I like. <laughs> cool. Um, welcome, everybody. Is there anybody from Africa on the call? Am I the only person in Africa right now? I would love to know. And in Sri Lanka, awesome. Cool, cool, cool. Yay. Okay, um, let's get the show on the road. I have a few slides and I've got some exercises for us to work through. We do have a virtual machine, which is running our studio, which people will be able to log in from Tanzania. Ha ha, yay, nice to, nice to see you, Lucas, on the call. Cool. Um, yeah, so we have a virtual machine that's running our studio um, on Posit Workbench. So for those of you who don't know, our studio has gone through a bit of a rebranding and they're now called Posit. And this is really about the, the sort of love story between R and Python. So uh, our studio workbench is, is uh, now called Posit Workbench, and this hosts um, our studio in the cloud, as well as VS Code and Jupyter Notebooks. We'll be working on this Posit Workbench platform today, but we'll be using the RStudio IDE, cloud-based. UCT alumnus, yes, that's awesome. Nice to, nice to have another uh, UCT person on the call, sick. Um, yeah. So we'll be working in uh, the RStudio IDE on, on a virtual machine. If you would like to just use your own local installation of RStudio, you can do that. Um, most of the activities, I mean, pretty much all of the activities today are like not reliant on the code being shared, um, although it will make your life a little bit easier to work in, in the cloud with me. Um, either way, that's fine. So I'm going to share that link in a bit and we can all uh, get logged in. Cool. Okay, let's get started. What further do? Let me share my screen. So I would love to also hear if uh, so in the chat what what you're using R for currently. What are some of the sort of tasks that you're um, writing code to be able to do? So go ahead and, and drop that in the call while I get set up here. Um, what industries are you from? Yeah, okay, can you guys see a slide deck that says RN for reproducible research? Yes, thanks, Shelley. Epidemiological research in pharma, use R for meta analysis, lab data, clinical micro. Awesome, epigenetics, sick. Clinical research, R oh, for everything, love that. Awesome, data viz, cleaning messy data, 
neuropsychology, occupational health. Wow, guys, it's been so long since I've been in a research environment. So it's so cool to hear what people are doing. Um, I did a PhD in molecular biology on these really cool plants called resurrection plants. And they, um, yeah, and I, I left uh, I left research a few years ago. Uh, it's really nice to get the, the highlights reel of research without the suffering of being in that. Awesome, cool. Okay, now let me get into this. Um, oh, go full screen. Okay, so we're going to be talking about R for reproducible, RN for reproducible research. Uh, in the chat, can you also just pop in there um, if you've ever worked with um, version control? If you haven't worked with any version control, so Git or subversion, can you just pop in the chat uh, the word no? Yes, Git, Git, awesome. If you haven't worked with Git, please do let me know as well. Um, I just want to sort of figure out how much emphasis to put on version control. No, okay, there are a few people who have not. My type of version control, document date, nice. <laughs> it's something, it's something, it's not nothing. Cool, awesome. <clears throat> okay, so a little bit about me and about the company I'm working for. I work for Jumping Rivers, they're a UK based consultancy and we have um, two sort of basic arms of the business consulting and training but we also work a little bit in infrastructure I'm actually on the data engineering team at Jumping Rivers I'm the token data scientist on the data engineering team and I help um, the data engineers kind of interpret what data scientists need from infrastructure and so we actually deploy a uh, positive infrastructure so the the um, positive workbench that we'll be working in today um, which runs our studio and VS Code uh, and other posit products are things that we deploy in the data engineering team. But yes, we do all things data science, sort of end to end from the infrastructure side all the way through to training um, and you know, writing code, writing shiny apps, maintaining these products. Uh, so yeah, full stack data science consultancy, uh, super nice people really recommend checking us out. I think we're also, we're sponsoring this event and we're also going to be at the job fair. So if you are, yeah, if you kind of like what you see, then maybe uh, pop us a message. Okay, so the outline for today's workshop, in case you missed it, what are our studio projects? So the RN concept for reproducibility really builds on top of projects. Um, so if you've never worked with a project before, it's kind of, tricky to understand why um, RN is a sort of step up from just a R studio project. Um, so we're talking about projects, we're talking about the limitations of projects, so just organizing your code into projects. Uh, we'll be talking about how RN can help with this, um, how it works, and then we'll create our first RN project. We'll also be reconstituting a project with RN. So a big component of this uh, sort of new way of working with R um, in, an, in an isolated environment is about sharing. You know, how do we share our code in a way that makes sense to other people? How do we make it usable for other people? Um, yeah, how do we prevent issues arising? So we'll be, we'll be reconstituting a project. Um, we'll be looking at how RN handles package repositories. So most people, most R users don't even know that there are different repositories where you can actually access your packages from. Most people just know about CRAN and they're like, cool, it comes from CRAN, seems legit, keep going. Um, so we'll be looking into how to handle package repositories from other sources. So then we'll also do a little activity around um, handling these package repositories. We'll finish off with some handy RN commands. And then I've, if we have time, I would really like an open discussion about using RN in your organization. So these little techniques and workflows that we sort of touched on today 
um, it's really nice to get together and brainstorm how we can actually use these in the work that we do out in the real world with the real data and the real issues and the real environments and the real messiness. Um, yeah, so it'd be really cool to brainstorm with some of you and hear from you like how you would integrate this into your own work. Okay, so in case you missed it, what are our studio projects? Projects are really the foundation of the best practice in R, especially for analysis. So it's basically converting a collection of files into a project or starting a new project um, has the following effect. It sets the working directory for that project. So wh whatever the, the um, folder is that you're doing the work in, that is going to become where R you know, reads things from, populates things to, any outputs that it generates are going to go and live in that working directory. And so this is really nice because you don't have to go set WD to wherever you're working, it just sets it for you automatically. Um, so that's really a really nice thing about projects. Um, you can also manage environment variables and objects on the project level rather than on the system level. So you can sort of start to make those environment variables specific to a piece of work. So if you need to define the same environment variable across different pieces of work, you don't have to set that environment variable globally and set it once for a project, and then it's there. Uh, projects really shine with Git um, in the RStudio IDE. So you can control your, your Git um, kind of uh, processes within the graphical user interface of RStudio if you've set it up as a project. And that's so helpful uh, and really nice. And we'll touch on a little bit of this today. So today, we're not gonna do like a full Git flow exercise. We're just gonna clone a, a remote repository into our R session. We're not gonna be pushing any code anywhere. We're just gonna be pulling code in. Um, but I'll show you a little bit of the layout of you know using Git in, in RStudio, especially since some of the humans on the call said that they've never worked with Git in RStudio before. So don't stress, it'll be a very light introduction to Git, um, but I think it's nice to get a little bit of exposure to what's possible within the RStudio IDE. Okay, so we're here to talk about reproducibility. So projects are great, but they can only get us so far. So imagine that you have uh, analysis files that you worked on five years ago, and you want to reconstitute this analysis today. Uh, there are a few things to consider when you're trying to do this. The first is like, what R version was I using? I might have been using R 3.6 five years ago. Was 3.6 even out five years ago? I don't know. I, I'm too much of a baby to know these things, but um, I'm sure that there are some of you on the call who've like kind of tucked away some work and revisited it and been like, oh my God, what was I using? So what R version was I using and what happens when I update R? Will my code still run? You know, so some packages only work in certain versions of R. Um, so can I still actually use this code? in the same way. Um, packages. What packages were used? What versions were they? Uh, will this code still run is the overarching question. And you know, where did the packages come from? You know, if it's an internally developed package or a package that's hosted on an alternative repository and you no longer have access to that package, uh, you know, it'll be impossible to actually do the work. So uh, RN seeks to address some of these issues. The first one is dependency management. So it helps you manage the package dependencies for your R project. So it tracks the packages that you used in your project, as well as the version numbers of those packages, which is super sick. Uh, so not only do I know it's dplyr, I know it's dplyr version 1.2. Um, because, you know, packages change in between, pa in between updates. You know, it can actually change considerably. So that's super helpful to know exactly the package version that you used. So isolation, you can create isolated project specific libraries. So this means that any packages installed or modified within a project don't infect the global R environment or other projects, providing a clean and self-contained environment. So uh, basically an isolated space for you to do your work. Any, anything will be contained within this, within this space. And those libraries, so, so you normally when you install an R package, you have a global library where that package gets installed to and, and any, you know, any R code will basically access that library. But with RN, you're basically creating 
on the project level, a mini library, a subset of only the packages that you need for a piece of work and at the version numbers that you need for that piece of work. Package restoration. So RN allows you to restore the package environment for a project. So not only do you know, okay, I used these packages, these versions to do this analysis, RN also gives you a way to restore those packages automatically. You don't have to then go manually install every package at its particular version to get your analysis to run. So that's really helpful. Okay, so let's look at the anatomy of an RN project. So the usual suspects are there. Uh, we have the git ignore if you're using version control. This will be very helpful because it tells git, the version control system, which files not to keep track of. And it also has um, a .proj file. So this is how you create a project in R um, is with um, Within the R Studio IDE, you create a new project and it creates this R proj file, which captures some information about that project, including things like the working directory. And um, yeah, so this would be my project.rproj. So these are things that you would see in a typical R project anyway. So we have some new friends. We have a project level.r profile. Um, in the chat, please let me know if you've ever heard of a .r profile file because I don't think most people have heard of a .art profile. Oh, yes, we're getting a lot of yeses. Excellent. No, yeah, okay, there's some no's, some yeses. Awesome. Thank you guys for being a very responsive chat. I really appreciate this. <laughs> Thank you. Don't know what it does or how you remove it. Okay, cool. So an R profile, we'll talk about this in a bit more detail, um, is a, is a script essentially that runs before your R or as your R session session starts. And so if you want your R session to start saying, hello Astrid, you look gorgeous today, you can go put in your R profile print, hello Astrid, you look gorgeous today. And when R starts up, it'll print that message for you. I should actually really put that in my R profile. <laughs> um, and um, so you can also set uh, options in the dot R profile. So if there's a particular um, in the context of RN, we're going to be talking about repositories. So if there's repositories where you want your packages to be downloaded from, you could set that information in the project level R profile. It's basically a place for um, kind of bits of code to work with your, your R projects. Are the slides available for this talk? I don't see link. Stephen, I'm so sorry. I um, was kind of working on the slides until like a few minutes before the talk, as usual. Um, so the slides are not in the slides are not on uh, on the website yet, but I will upload them after this. Um, and consider adding praise praise on startup. <laughs> that is cool. I, I like that. Thank you. Yeah. So your R profile enables you to sort of set options for your work, which is super helpful. Um, so there's a project level R profile. So most people know of the R profile at the user level. So at the user level, I'm telling R that it must do these things for me, but you can also set that on the project level. And then it's contained within your RN project. That information is isolated to that project. And so whatever's in my user level R profile doesn't actually impact my project level R profile. Then there's the rnf.lock. We're going to dig into this file in a lot more detail. This is the file that captures things like the R version, it captures what packages are installed. Um, what packages, not only what packages, no, it doesn't capture what packages are installed. It tells you what packages are used in the code of your project. So um, you can have lots of random packages installed, but it will only capture the ones that are actually used. So it reads your scripts and it grabs the little library entries and it captures the versions of the packages that are imported in your code, as well as the dependencies of those packages. Super helpful. Um, and this is what's used to reconstitute your um, project. Then we have the RNV um, folder, which has a few subfolders depending on what you're doing. Like the library folder has that little mini package library that I was talking about earlier. Um, that subset essentially of the packages that you'll use in the project, actually go and live in that um, library folder within your RN folder. Then there's a the history, which has 
history of the project. Um, there's some other folders in here. Um, and then finally, there's the activate.r file, which is what's used to reconstitute the project, essentially. It's what um, RNV uses to like activate itself, essentially. Um, so the RNV lock file is something we're going to be talking about a lot. Um, so I highly recommend checking out this link over here. This is to um, the RNV um, documentation. It's all linked in the slides, which you'll get after this. The documentation is really well written and helpful and great. I know RNV is not even at version one yet, but like they're they're doing great, sweetie. Like you're doing great. Like this is a really nicely documented package. Um, let me just close my uh, my slides again. Sorry. Oh. oh, did I go and kill my slides as well somehow? Oh, I did. No, that's annoying. Sorry, guys. Two seconds. Render. Kevin Ushi does a fantastic job with documentation of rent, a massive improvement over RN, I guess, a massive improvement over Packrat. Yeah, yeah, it's it's lit, bro. <laughs> so, thank you, Dokes. Let's jump back to my slides. Thank you for keeping the comments uh, lively. Eric, while I fumble with my slides. Appreciate it. Okay, so the anatomy of the lock file. So this is what it looks like. This is um, for just two packages, Markdown and MIME. And so you can imagine if you're working on a project that's quite complex and uses many libraries, that this file can actually get pretty long because it lists the packages and their dependencies. Um, but sort of basic anatomy of this file it grabs the R version and the repositories from which the packages were downloaded. So by default, it'll have the CRAN repository and it links to the CRAN rproject.org website, which is where the packages will come from. But if you have other packages, um, other, yeah, other repos specified for your um, particular user level R, um, uh, our profile or you've set options in the project itself to pull packages from other repositories this information is captured in the in the lock file um, so then in the packages field so this is a json format uh, the packages here we have each package as a label and then the version of the package where the package is downloaded from so these would these sort of cran labels here correspond to the repositories um, up here at the top so if you have other repositories, you'll, you can expect to see other repositories listed here. And then a hash for the package installation. So the hash is calculated from the package, um, uh, the package, it's the package version, the source code, uh, I think the operating system as well. And so what are, maybe not operating system, don't, don't take me, don't take my word on that. But um, basically what this hash does is it enables RN to reconstitute those packages exactly the way that they were on the first, um, I guess the first environment in which this lock file was generated. And so the package, the hash is really important for kind of replicating the environment as you expect, does not track. Thanks, thanks Mo, awesome. Uh, it's so great to have experienced our people on the call so I can delve into the public knowledge. It's awesome. Thank you. Okay, so let's create our first RN project. We're going to create this from first principles, uh, very basic. Uh, it's not going to be super technical. Um, so we've got this training uh, VM. And I'm going to just show you quickly how to log into it. And then I'm going to give you five minutes to log yourself in um, and grab a username and password. So I'm going to log myself in. Please don't take my username and password, <laughs> please. Yes, I'm going to send you the URL, Martin, but after I demonstrate, because I don't want people to steal my username. Um, OK, so we're going to go to the training welcome page. And we've got a password here, date cloudberry is our password. 
Um, so you need to enter your email address into the welcome page, grab your username, and then head to the training environment, log in, and then launch a session. So I'm going to show you how to do that now. Okay, so it takes you to the training course authentication portal, and you'll pop in your username or your email address, sorry, astrid at jumpingwebbles.com. I want to just say to you all right now, I'm not going to recover these email addresses. So don't be worried about me sending you spam. I'm not going to spam you. <laughs> I will not keep your email address. It just needs to be a unique identifier um, for the uh, DM. Oh, that does not look like the password. Date hyphen Cloudberry, right, submit. And then a username and password is generated. So this is a unique username and password. So I'm number five. Five is actually my lucky number. So I'm grabbing my username and password and then I'm heading to this training environment link at the top. And then I'm gonna log in user five and my password and sign in. So if I when you get to Posit Workbench, yes, Andrew, I'm going to send it now. Um, you're going to log in and create a new session over here. Okay. Uh, Ask Studio Pro, start session, and you'll get a Ask Studio ID opening up. So while that's baking, I'm going to just send this link through. And yeah, this is the welcome app. So when you're ready and you have a username and password, just head over to the training environment and connect there. Cool. What was the, oh, sorry. Yes, date Cloudberry, date hyphen cloud. Very nice. Thanks, Rose. Okay. <clears throat> when you're in, just uh, type in the chat in um, so that I'm aware. People are logging in okay. It's always interesting when we have many humans on the call. Um, Denise is fastest fingers first. Well done. And sick. What do you do when you have a user? Aha. When you have a user, you go to uh, rn. Sorry, rn dot. Uh, start training. Uh, sorry, slash welcome. Give me one sec. Welcome. Um, you click on this training environment button at the top. Yes, you use your email in this in the welcome app over here. So you put, type your email and the password over here. And then when you get your unique user username and password pair, then you log into the training environment. And then you use your username that you that you generate with the welcome app, not your email. Cool. People are in. Awesome. I'm just going to give it one minute. Which password should we put in? So you put in your unique uh, username and password. So I'm going to just show this process again. So in the welcome app, I'm typing astrid at jumpingorders.com, right? My email address. And then I type date loudberry which is the password. I'll just type it in here, date, Cloudberry. Right, and then we get a username and a password. Username, password, don't take mine. <laughs> and don't take a random one because you might end up kicking someone else out of the training environment, which is not kind. It's not how we roll in the Zoom call. Um, so we click on the training environment, and then you can pop your username and password in there. So username being u zero zero whatever and password. Ready for some Ring? <laughs> Akon is like, come on, bro, get it going, move it along. <laughs> cool. Let's do some Ring. Sick. Okay. So this is what your 
uh, our studio environment looks like now, you can go ahead and click on one demo.r. We're going to create a new project. So you, this screen might end up closing. What I recommend um, is to download your um, the, the files so that it's not annoying, you know, switching between projects. So you can export your files from Workbench over here using the export button. Uh, oh, please select one or more files to export. So just export all your files, right? Like that. I'll see to export .zip. So that'll download. Uh, and then you can just copy and paste across these files if you need to. Um, I didn't get a username and password when I submit. Um, how many people are trying to log in? I only have space for 100. Um, I'm going to just um, pause on the logins for now. And in the break, if anybody's having an issue, then I will, um, then I'll help you out in the break time. Okay, cool. So in the meantime, just kind of watch along. Okay, so <clears throat> let's create a new project. Um, so to, you'll see here when we log in that we have no project open currently. Let me just see a minute. Right, so project is none. So you can create a new R Studio project in a few different ways. You, there's a little R Studio uh, project uh, icon over here. It's like R within a little box, right? So you can go ahead and click on that, or you can click on this little drop down over here, little drop down over here, and go new project. So we're going to create a new directory, right? So you could create a new directory, use an existing directory, or basically clone a repo essentially in this project generation um, uh, space. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start with a new directory. So new project, blank project, I'm not doing anything fancy. And we're gonna give it a name. So here I'm gonna name mine RMV uh, test. Doesn't really matter what it's called. And I'm gonna just create it in the home um, directory. Here, I'm going to go ahead and create a Git repository. So initialize Git within this repository. And I'm going to use rnv with this project. So this is one way that you can make an rnv project happen. Um, you can also use the rnv package and a function called init, which we might dig into a little bit later. But you know, using the UI is also totally fine. Okay, so you can click open in a new session and maybe this will be less annoying. You can also specify your R version here. So 4.2, 4.1.2 or 3.6.3. So this um, instance of, of Posit Workbench comes loaded with three different R versions. So not all of us have the luxury of multiple R versions when we're working on our own um, sort of uh, desktop version of our studio. So it's quite cool to be able to use different R versions. So we're going to open in a new session and go create project. Okay, initializing RNV. Okay, I can call my session, since I'm creating a new session, I can give it a name. So I'm going to call this RNV test, same name as the project, doesn't really matter. I'm going to open that session. Oh, and it's telling me that Firefox is blocking my R studio. Cool. So now I have this new project, right? It's in its own session, which is quite nice. And if we quickly go back to our initial session, right? If you want to see what sessions you have open, you can click on this drop down here. So I have my local R studio session and I have this RNV test one open as well. So that's quite nice to see what sessions open. You can also navigate back to your workbench uh, sort of homepage just by clicking on this big R button over here. So that takes you back to Posit Workbench. And then you can see here are my two sessions. So this is my like vanilla non project -y session, just R, no project open. And here is my test environment now. So this, this RNV test is now its own isolated RNV environment that's totally separate to the main um our our environment on this machine 
Mo says, Astrid, if you have a Git repo with this stuff, I can work locally instead to free up space. Um, I do not, unfortunately. Um, but I do have a repo for us to clone later for an exercise. So um, that'll hopefully help. Okay. But I don't think that we have 100 people on the on the VM. I think people are just struggling a bit with, um, with the password and stuff. So that's cool. Uh, thankfully, this R Studio instance is using Linux binary package formats that makes bootstrapping library much faster than compiling packages from source. Yes, exactly, Eric. Yeah, Eric knows what's up. Cool. Okay, so here we have our R session open. We've got these files that I was speaking about um, in the slides. This is the anatomy, basic anatomy of our RNV um, environment. Uh, we have our project file. Like I mentioned earlier, so this basically enables you to click on this button, this RN file, and open up your RN project on your machine. Uh, we have our RN folder, which is where our packages are living. So we can already see that's populated with some packages. It's got the RN package and not much else, uh, but this will change very soon. Okay, we've got our activate.r file, which is what initializes RN when we start up the project. We've got some additional files like settings.json. Um, I'm not going to go too much into this, but you can set some additional parameters in, in your project. Um, and some git ignore files. So there's a git, git ignore file at the sort of root of the project as well as in the RN file. So we'll dig into that as well. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my other session so that I can just flick between the files. Oh, I suppose I could open it here. No, let me not confuse people. Uh, let me go to my original session so we can look at our project files that I shared. Waiting for the session to start. Okay. So I'm back on my sort of main page. And this is where I've put um, all of the files that we're gonna be working through. These are R files, but they don't need to be .R files really. Like they could just be plain text files. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're R-ing right now. <laughs> cool. And you'll see here is the RN test folder that I just made that is running in the session over here. Okay. so. I want to go back to my um, instructions. So we created a new project. We initialized that project with rinv and git, and we had a little scroll around the files that were present there. So when a normal project sessions op session opens up, what do you notice? How is this different from a normal R session? So a normal R session looks kind of like that. And when this one opens, it looks basically the same, right? Except there's this extra little line over here, which is telling you that RN is being used and that it's loaded, right? Um, a really nice command is to run status. RNV.status will tell you that the project is already synchronized with the lock file. So if you're confused about your project, I just want you to run status and like have this as an anchor point that you keep coming back to. Like, what is the status of my project? Like, is everything kind of working as expected? And it will tell you the project is already synchronized with the lock file kind of as a baseline. Okay. Um, so yes, we explored the project files. The RN folder holds our um, library which is where our packages are gonna actually install to, right? And we have our lock file over here. We, we went through the sort of basic structure of this in the slides. We've got our R version, we've got our repositories and our packages. And so here, because we have no files and no um, like packages installed in this isolated environment yet, it would, um, it, it will only tell us that rnv is here, nothing else is here. You'll notice that there are two repositories here in this uh, lock file already, right? There's a CRAN repository and DRAT. And this CRAN looks a little bit different to the CRAN that I spoke about in the slides. The URL is different. This is running, this is pulling from package manager. So uh, I'm gonna open this link. 
oh no, stop. I'm gonna open this link and a new tab. <laughs> Invalid request, sorry. So Package Manager is a posit product that enables you to host uh, R and Python packages in, in a repository that is not CRAM, essentially. So uh, here is Posit, Posit's actual package manager. So they are hosting a CRAM mirror. So this repo here is, is CRAM, basically. The only difference is that this uh, CRAM serves many different binaries. So binaries are pre-built packages, essentially. So when you get a source package, um, you can also download source packages here. Yeah? But you, when you when you download a binary, it's already kind of pre-compiled for your operating system. So when you download it, it's a much smaller um, package, and it it downloads much quicker onto your machine. And so our training VMs are pulling from Package Manager, not from CRAN, and they're pulling um, the version of packages that are built for um, Ubuntu Focal, which is the Ubuntu operating system that we're running. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of a kind of background of like where your packages are actually coming from. And they're, they're not coming straight from CRAN. Um, but if you were to set this up on your own machine and if you have no repositories specified, um, this will actually come from CRAN CRAN, from the real CRAN, right? And then we have another one, which is our own internal draft repo. So we create packages for every training course that we run just to make it easier to import data or like specific functions. Um, so those packages are internally developed by Jumping Rivers. They have no business being on CRAN. So we created a draft repository to house those packages. And so that's what you're seeing here. Where do these repositories come from? Like how does RStudio know that these things need to be in the lock file? Like how's that, ha how's that whole thing happening? That's happening because these repositories are specified in the R profile, but not the R profile on the user level, the R profile for the whole training VM. So R profiles are also hierarchical. So if you have a training VM or if you have a sort of uh, professional version of RStudio, you can specify what repositories your packages come from at the organizational level, which then feeds into everybody's work, right? Um, so that is where RNV is actually pulling this information from. Okay, so any packages that we install are not going to come from CRAN, it's like straight CRAN. They're going to come from um, our Studio Posits version of CRAN, and they're going to be pre-compiled. And any um, additional packages are not going to come from, from there even. They're going to come from our own internal repository. Okay, uh, enough rambling on that. So yeah, so here we have our, our infrared lock. So I want you to kind of take a mental snapshot of what this looks like right now, because it's gonna change very soon. Okay, um, if you push this work to GitHub, what files would not be uploaded to the remote repository? So if you went and changed this repository now, by default, which are the files that are gonna be ignored by Git? Uh, so this information comes from the .git ignore file. So on the sort of root level of the project, it's the normal, it's the usual suspects that we would expect to be ignored by Git. Um, the R project user, the R history, R data, R user data, sort of there's nothing special, nothing to write home about over here. And then in the RN folder, there's another Git ignore, right? So these are all of the folders within your RN folder that are not gonna be uploaded to GitHub or GitLab if you push, and they're not gonna be added to your Git commit history. Any changes to these files, uh, folders are, are not going to show up, right, in your Git history. Um, and one of them is the library. I think that's probably one of the most important ones. So the packages that you install on, on your machine in this environment are not gonna be things that your collaborator or yourself in five years time are going to, you're not gonna have access to those files, like those program files. Those things are not gonna be part of the sort of development of the project. It's very important that, that your machine uh, has its own um, packages that it's, you know, it has uh, isolated in this environment. Um, so those things are not gonna be transmitted. Other things, uh, the staging area. So this is where when you download packages, 
they first go to the staging area and then they get added to a library. If there's any issues, those kind of things will be resolved before they're added to a library. Um, and a few other folders, not going to get into too much detail, but yes, so there's two levels where Git ignoring is happening by default. So that's, I think, just important to flag. Okay, um, let's do a little bit of Ring. <laughs> We're going to create an, a dot R script and copy over some code. Right, so we're gonna just copy over this code from between step three and step four. So I'm just gonna copy that into a new R script. So creating a new R script and just adding my code in here. And I'm gonna save this script as just, I don't know, um, visualization, visualization. Uh, so it's gonna create a new R script for me. So because I've created an R project, R Studio project, when I create a new script and just save it, it saves to the working directory of that project. So it's saving into this RN test folder, not into my home directory by default because I've created this project. Okay, so R Studio is very kindly telling me packages, flame tree and ggplot are not installed, right? So I'll need to install these packages to actually create this visualization in this R script. Um, here I'm using the flame tree package, uh, which is a really cool package created by Danielle Navarro. Uh, it's a, a generative art package. It brings me so much joy. I use it for all my examples because it's just really fun and nice. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend if you have some time to kill and want to make some art in R, explore the package more. Okay, I'm not going to go click install. I'm going to go to my console and chuck in a little rn status again. I'm just going to click the up arrow and that'll give me my previous command. So it's telling me the following packages are used in this project but not installed ggplot2 and flame tree. I think somebody asked here, would, what would it say if it's not synchronized, just that it's not synchronized? Yeah, so it should tell you that um, the project has not been initialized. So if there is no rnv lock file and you and you type in rnv status, it's going to be like, there's no lock file. Like, what are we doing here? We need a lock file. Um, and if you need to actually install something, it'll tell you as well. So here, this is really useful, right? So it's telling you that we don't have these packages. So we can go in and just type rnv install and the package names, right? So I'm going to just chuck them in here, ggplot2, 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 and flame tree. Uh, I quite like using the rnv install command, but you could also just go install that packages. It's fine either way. <clears throat> and can you also click the top? Yes, you absolutely can. That's totally fine. Yeah. So where is this actually installing from? PackageManager.rc.com, Linux, Focal, latest, source, ggplot. So it's actually pulling from this library that we've specified here. So I must, I mean this repository, I must say that um, although I've just specified and latest, it's redirected based on the operating system that I'm using. I don't know how this magic happens. Maybe somebody who works on this package <laughs> can tell me how does it know <laughs> which, um, which one to use. I would love to know. Uh, that's not from our end. Oh, Mo, lay it on us. Give us, spill the tea. <laughs> that's basic R functioning. Oh, cool. Cool. Great, so it's now gone and downloaded all of the packages and it's installing them into the library. So not, yeah, it's installing them. We'll get to the caching later. Cool, so it's it's grabbing not just the packages that I wanted, the top level packages, you know, get ggplot and flame tree, but it's also doing all of the, the um, dependencies for me as well. I think if we're all doing this on the machine at the same time, I don't know, it's pretty beefy VM, so it should be fine. Um, but yeah, cool. So installed 38 packages in 1.78 minutes, not too bad. 
it's how R always knows which OS it is installing patches for. Dude, R is cool, man. R is, I thought this was RN, but no, it's best R. Sick. Okay, so let's have a look at our new library, right? So we've just installed all these packages. And before, where there was only RN, we now have all of the things that we need for the package uh, for the for the code to run. Um, and what's really cool is that I, you know, it predicted this from looking at my code. So it's going and checking out these library function calls and, you know, telling you what's needed in your project, which I think is really sick. Okay, um, so save your script and install the packages required to run it and check the status. Okay, so let's check the status of our project now. So rn double colon status. You could also just, uh, you know, library rn, and then you don't have to type rn every time. Um, but I'm a, I'm a fan of the double colon notation. Anyway, so uh, the following packages are installed, but are not recorded in the lock file. So it's telling us that it's installed these packages, but they're not captured, you know, for later reconstitution. So we're going to use what it tells us. We're going to do what it tells us and use rn snapshot to grab a snapshot. So it's going, it gives you a little warning before it goes and updates your lock file. So the following packages will be updated in the lock file, right? All of these, and it's going from nothing to a package version. Do you want to proceed? Yes, I do. And now it tells us that it's written to rnf.lock. So let's go back. Um, oh, I've already got it open over here. Cool. So now I have a way longer list of packages than before. So you'll notice that some of them have a RSPM repository and we only have a draft and a CRAN up here. So if anybody on the call knows <laughs> why this happens, I've been mystified for a while. I'm assuming that it detects that this is a package manager, an RStudio package manager or Posit package manager URL. That was my hypothesis. Maybe Mo has an answer for us um, about why it's giving a different environment uh, variable name here. I think it might be something to do with the activate.r script. I'm not sure, but I would love to crowdsource that information. Uh, Mo says, I only know because I've been going on that rabbit hole lately and you don't want to know, just be happy about the auto magic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, sometimes you just, um, you just don't want to know the answers to things. <laughs> uh, is there any link to get about this? Cool. Uh, Eric, if you feel like uh, elaborating, I would really appreciate it. Uh, yes, RSPM does stand for RStudio Package Manager, now called Posit Package Manager, uh, because it hosts both R and Python packages. Cool. Um, great. So we've updated our rnf.lock file, right? So that's looking cute. Let's just check another status in here, just so that we can make sure the project is already synchronized with the lock file, right? So this project is kind of the information is captured um for for this project um snapshot time right so we, we skipped ahead a little bit here so uh we now have our our rn dot lock has changed to reflect the new packages um and the r version ah when you want to uh, deactivate rn so right now we have rn in an activated state Right, so it's initialized, it's created the environment and we're in that environment right now. Uh, we're sort of isolated from our like main R install and our operating system generally. We're kind of in this little bubble. So what happens when we deactivate? So we're gonna deactivate, right? So <coughs> um, I'm gonna just go R and deactivate. Uh, it doesn't look like much has changed 
but we are now no longer within that um, RN environment. Um, to, to, ah, this is, oh yes, this is actually, thanks earlier me for prompting current me with information. The packages tab is now different. So this is our, these are all of the packages that come preloaded with the CM. So these are, these should be on all of your machines, right? If we look here at our visualization script, we can see that FlameTree and ggplot are acquired but not installed. So we're getting this message again, right? And that's because we are now outside of that um, RN bubble. So let's reactivate it. So we're gonna use the activate function here. This activates our bubble again, right? Um, this should not be here, no. Um, but if we go and have a look, we can see ggplot2 is now installed in our package collection, as well as uh, flame tree over here. So we deactivate and ggplot2 might still be here because this machine might have it actually. Um, G, ggplot2 is here, but flame tree certainly is not. So it doesn't actually install, see, no flame tree. So it doesn't actually install that, um, that package into your general R library, right? It installs it into the project specific library. Okay. So yes, so activating and deactivating our environment. So I'm still in the same project, right? So I'm like, if I deactivate now, I'm still in the same project. It restarts R, but it starts R outside of the project. And then when I activate, it starts R in the project, right? Um, and any environment variables, for example, that I were to set outside of the environment wouldn't carry through into the isolated environment and vice versa. So in that sense, it's it's completely its own universe. Okay, back to the slides. Uh, let me put up the screen here. I'm gonna recap and then we're gonna take a little break. Excuse me, not found. This is what happens when you don't. Organize yourself. Okay, let's actually take a break now and we come back from the break. I can, I'll have all my slides set up and things. Okay, so let's take a 10 minute break. So we'll come back at quarter past. Whatever quarter past is for you, wherever you are in the world. For me, that is. 1815. Okay, I'm going to be on the call if anybody needs help with just setting up their, if they can't log into the VM or they're struggling with that. Uh, yes. Let me, I'm going to paste code from demo two onwards into the chat so that people can follow even if they aren't um, managing to log into the VM. First. If anybody needs help, just unmute yourselves and we can, I can help you log in. Um, sorry, some more questions here. Yeah, thanks, Mo. That's a good point. What is the difference, to, the difference of using Conda versus RN in R? Amy, I have no idea. I hope someone else can answer your question. I've never used Conda for R stuff. Um, I'm sure there is a good answer to that. You post code. Yeah.
As far as I know, Conda time capsules the whole environment, including version of R and Python. Okay, that's cool. Honda is Conda is tailored to Python and will not manage R packages directly. Yeah, I've only ever used Conda with um, with Python. I know Conda is used in tandem with Reticulate, but I could be wrong. Yeah. I've only used um, Reticulate and wept. <laughs> I'm, I've not quite managed to do Reticulate. I actually kind of gave up at some point and just started learning Python. And then Corto came around and now everything is fine. <laughs> everything is good in life. And I was paste demo one, sure. My message is too long. That's annoying. Okay, let's make this short. Okay. And the other half. Alan says, R will only tell you which version of R you're using, but it doesn't control it. We're using singularity for that. Oh. Um, introducing R to fix compatibilities and reproducibility. Sick. Yeah, it's so interesting. Um, the idea of controlling things, locking down an environment. So um, we've been doing a little bit of work in validated environments. So package validation, and also the valid, like using packages, validated packages in the validated environment, and um, it's complex because you know you can specify the global R profile, right? To only or to yeah, by default install packages from certain locations. Um, but people can just come through with dev tools and install using a link, you know, um, unless they aren't connected to the internet, unless you have like the way to really lock it down fully is to have your own package manager, your own posit workbench um, and those two things only talk to each other and you know the package managers on its own server can talk to the internet but um, workbench can't talk to anyone um, the following link is broken oh vasiki that is an astute observation that is by design <laughs> someone's skipping ahead in the activities <laughs> um yeah we're gonna fix that Mo says, Conda is an entire thing. RNV is a smaller piece. RN makes it easier to track packages and versions used without forcing it. Aha. Uh -huh. It also redirects the lib paths to project specific ones that does not collide with the user's environment. Like, I might have reasons to lock my own computer's version of DigiPlot2 to something because I need it for something specific in that version, but a project needs a newer version. RM ensures I can do that without messing up or even having to hack my own bleep solutions. <laughs> yeah. While still allowing me to work on my local computer or the environment I'm used to without needing things like containers. Yeah. Yeah. Something I haven't explored at all is RM with uh, CI, CI CD. 
and bulk automation. That would be interesting to delve into. I use Iron with containers by Docker or Podman. It's my mainstreaming system actually does not have R installed. Everything I make is with containers. Yo, Eric. <laughs> Eric should be presenting. Mo and Eric, you should be presenting this workshop. <laughs> Letting people work how they're used to without adding extra stuff. That's true. I really like that strategy. Um, I, I like um, kind of meeting people where they're at. It's uh, a good strategy. <laughs> okay. I'm an orange cheerleader. <laughs> oh, Eric. Eric, are you just here for fun? <laughs> cool. Let me get back to where I was. Um... I'm trying to up my game of teaching RNF to others at the day job. Aha, nice. Yeah, I had um, the very, I think it was serendipitous that I wanted to do this talk. And then we have a client who uh, we're giving this, well, I'm going to develop it more into a nice uh, training for them. Uh, yeah, I would love to know, Muhammad, Eric, how has RNF helped you in projects? And has it been, you know, as a consultant, we come in, we make recommendations, obviously things that we use and we understand, but um, you don't often get to kind of be there for all of the wailing and gnashing of teeth of like onboarding users to a new piece of tech and um, like, getting them familiar and getting them comfortable with it. That's a whole other bit of emotional labor to go through. So I would love to hear um, your experience. Oh, Mo uses, it's so smooth. That's good to know. That's very encouraging. Um, can you walk us how to get into the training environment again for those of us just connecting? Sure, Tessa, absolutely. Okay, um, let me just go back. So um, you're going to click on this link over here and you pop in your um, email address and the password, which is date hyphen proud. And then you'll get your own username and password. So uh, you followed by a number and then a password which is basically the um, <clears throat> the password with the username tacked on there. And please don't use mine. Do not use number five. <laughs> no one has kicked me off yet, which is amazing, um, but please don't. Okay, and then you're gonna click on this training environment button at the top, and then that'll take you to a workbench, which will look like this. It won't look like this, it'll look like this. <laughs> and you pop your username and password in, the unique one that you've just generated, right? Don't put your email address here. Click sign in. And then it'll take you to Posit Workbench and you can click on new session to get started. Eric says, I am the fundamentals for analysis and shiny application projects. I need full control of dependencies in case I need custom versions of packages that the central package library does not have available. Yeah. Plus it ensures my collaborators are operating with the same package environment and in Pharma, that is a huge point to address. Yes. Uh, yeah, 100%. Nice. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to go back to my session, my first session, just with my little R scripts open. Um, while people are joining back on the call, if you've just come back from a break, I would recommend scrolling up in the chat and reading some of this because people have been uh, laying some good truths and yeah, making some interesting comments. 
So while I get set up here, you can go and have a look. Okay, so I've popped the training welcome app again in the uh, chat. I'm just going to pop the steps to get logged in again. Um, so that this is smooth for people who are trying to get in. Um, I also copied and pasted the um, the actual contents of the R scripts, you know, just the, the instructions for the exercises. So the first one, let's clone a repo containing an RNF project. That's the next one that we're going to work on. And then the last one actually ended up being the first one. Whatever, it's a mess. It is what it is. <laughs> I'm sure everybody will find their way around this. We have a shared library in the lab, but packages have been getting overwritten as others install or update things. Breaking workflows. Yeah, I can imagine, Alan. So when starting looking at RN, seems to be working. That's great. Nice. Okay. Thank you, lively chatters. I appreciate you so much. It's so nice. Let's proceed. So what have we learned? We learned that our status lets us know if our project and our lock file are in sync. Um, it's kind of our, I like it as an anchor point, like something to keep coming back to. And I find that the, the messages that it gives are really helpful and they give you prompts of um, other functions to use. So just, yeah, status is your friend. A snapshot synchronizes the project and the lock file. So it looks at what's in the R scripts or the R markdown associated with the project or quarter docs, uh, quarter uh, QMD files. Uh, any library calls, basically, it takes those and pops into the lock file, including the dependencies, captures the version, package hash, everything, beautiful. Um, so snapshot and status, I think when you're, initially developing a project, those are the ones you're probably going to use the most. Deactivate, deactivates the isolated project environment, takes you back to your main R um, session. Activate, activates the isolated project environment. So you could be in your project, but it's not isolated, right? So just be very careful about activating. Another thing we didn't use is rnv init which replaces the little GUI point and click thing that we did where we clicked initialize project as rnv. Init, if you have an existing project, you can go rnv init and it'll create all of the, all of the rnv specific kind of infrastructure around your project. It'll create that when you initial, initialize using init. So super helpful. Um, so those are the two ways that you can create a project, an uh, rnv project. Yeah. Okay, I'll go next slide, please. Thank you. But yes, we're gathered here to talk about reproducibility. So imagine that your colleague has shared an analysis with you using rnv to capture the state of their machine when they performed this analysis. Um, and we want to reconstitute this analysis. So most, I don't know, I don't want to say most, but many, 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 many projects are shared using git, git, um, version control that's pushed to some sort of cloud, um, whether that's internal for your organizations so and not accessible to the broader internet or on the internet itself. Um, and so what we're gonna be doing is cloning a Git uh, repository. And I'm really excited for people who've never worked with Git before to just gain a little bit of exposure to it. Um, so we're gonna just clone a repo. Um, does using rnv init automatically activate the isolated project environment? Yeah, so you need to be in the project um, and then it and then you run in it and then it actually, yes, it activates as well. Um, so it's like, yeah, initializes, gives you the project files and activates the project at the same time. And remember a way that you can tell that the project is activated is when you open your R session, you get that little message saying that rn version what what is being used okay so let's clone a collaborators repo so i'm gonna go to um my uh first session again i'm just gonna close all these extra tabs here <laughs> excuse me 
right? So I'm going to go to demo2, to demo.r, right? So we're going to clone a repo containing an RN project. So again, we're going to create a new project in our studio. So again, I would say uh, new project, version control. Um, oh, what I wanted to say is, yeah, we're going to create a new project and, and make sure to click the open a new session um, button again, just to like keep it in its own tab on the internet. So version control, right? So earlier we just went new directory. Now we're checking out a version controlled repository. We are cloning a project from a Git repo. And so we're going to stick the URL into this field over here. And I don't think I copied it. No, I definitely did not. <laughs> so let me copy this. This is the URL for the Git repo. I'm going to just um, open the link in a new tab. It's a public repository. You don't need any username and password to clone it. You can just clone it. Um, so we're going to clone with HTTPS. Um, and I'm just going to copy this link. And when I create my new project, new project, version control, git, I'm going to stick it into this uh, URL here. Uh, Alan asks, how do we start a new session? Oh, okay. So um, when we actually clone this, so when you click on new project over here, right? And we do this whole process again. Sorry for those who've seen it now the fourth time. Um, we're going to check on this open in a new session box down here in the project wizard. Um, that, or you can go back to this R button over here, this R Studio button, and that'll take you back to your like home screen. And then you can create a new session there. But I find this is easier just to open a new session. Okay, project directory name is going to be rnv underscore example. Oh, let me go hyphen because it's hyphenated in the URL, rnv example, right? And again, I'm just going to create it as a, as a subdirectory of my home directory. So create project. So now it's cloning, right? And I because it's creating a new session, I need to give the session a name again. So I'm going to call this one rnv dash example. Open session. And now it's creating this new session for me. Got it. Sick, Alan. Thanks for the feedback. Um, Eric says, if you're using R from outside R Studio, say in a terminal or VS Code, make sure your working directory is the project directory before using the RN functions. That can trip people up. Great. Thanks for that tip, Eric. That's good to know. Um, it's so interesting uh, thinking about how people use R because, um, you know, the way I learned R is I, it, I didn't even consider, I didn't even know that like you could just type R in your terminal and then an R session pops up. I thought R and R Studio were the same thing. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not sure why it's bringing up my, <clears throat> my history here, but anyway. Okay, so I've created this RN project. Well, I've cloned a project, I've created a project. I cloned this repository from Git, right? Um, if we navigate to the Git tab here on, um, on the right-hand sort of top window, uh, you know, this is our default tab here. We're going to the Git one. You can see any changes that happen to the repository will appear here unless they're part of the Git ignore, right? So if Git is ignoring a file or a folder, we won't see any changes appearing in this window. Um, but I really like this because you know, if you use Git in the terminal, um, it can be a, a little bit obscure. Sometimes you need to type commands to actually see what's changed in your tree. Um, but in, in RStudio, it's like right here and this is you know to do with the fact that there's git integration into the rstudio ide um and yeah you can push and pull and commit um uh, your all your code all your changes over here it's really nice and we can see that we're on the main branch so we've pulled the main branch and we're on the main branch on our local machines you guys won't be able to push anything to that remote repository because you don't have like credentials to do that. Um, so this is just really an exercise in pulling. So imagine that you've pulled this bit of code from your collaborator <clears throat> and that's what we're gonna be digging into right now. So we can see here, 
this code doesn't include an rnv folder, right? It's got the rnv.lock, it's got the project, um, it's got a readme, it's got a little R script, uh, it's got its project level R profile and it's git ignore. And so um, when we started R, it's telling me here, it's giving me a warning in file name R encoding equals encoding, cannot open file R in activate.r. So no such file or directory. So what's happened here is that as a collaborator, we've gotten the rnv.lock, but we haven't gotten any of the other, you know, we haven't gotten the activate.r file that's going to actually initialize um, rnv and like make that actually work. Um, yeah. So we need to provide that infrastructure essentially to the project. Out of curiosity, what happens when we type R in status here? Oh, it's thinking. It's thinking real hard. <laughs> cool, so it's giving us something. It says here, the following packages are recorded in the lock file, but not installed, ggbiz. Use rn for restore to restore the packages recorded in the lock file. I want to see what happens when we use activate. Great, so now it's created the uh, rn folder for us and it's created activate.r and our library folder. So it's created all of those things using the fact that there's a lock file in the project repository in the project files um, to go and create that. Um, so here we're being told to use rn restore to restore the packages recorded in the lock file. So when you get code, um, including a lock file, obviously you're not getting those packages. You're just getting the instructions. You're getting the recipe to make the packages happen for yourselves. Um, so Mo tried rn restore and actually did all that and started installing things. That's great. So rm is clearly a very clever package. So we're going to follow the instructions and we're going to restore this package library, right? And so, oh, let's have a quick look at our library, right? Our library is now empty. It's only got rm in it because it's just been initialized, right? And so all of these packages that are required for the project to work, all of these packages are recorded in the lock file, right? Um, let's have a look here. Oh, the VM is, is going slow. Okay, in the R info lock file, we've got some repositories and we've got all of these packages, right? So all of these packages are appearing here to be installed. So we want to proceed. And we're querying repositories, repositories for available source packages. It seems to be installing from source. Done. It's thinking. Um, I'm just gonna uh, think here. Yeah. So the difference between R and R thing. Yes. Uh, sorry. How did you get the pull from Git? Ah. Uh, so um, in the instructions over here, there is a. Uh, remote and how I got that was by going to the repo and then going to code over here this little drop down clone with https and then I just copied this uh, url over here and that's all you need to clone the repository if you're using ssh so if you have um, basically if you have rights to pull from a repository and you're using the ssh protocol to do that, you can you would should rather use the SSH option over here. Um, yeah. So because this is like a totally public repository and there's no like issue with um, anybody cloning this, HTTPS is fine. Also, I'm not going to put all everyone's SSH credentials on our machine. <laughs> okay. Um, cool. So it's downloading packages. So it's retrieving them from the package manager. 
uh, repository. This might take a while, you know. I think it's also maybe taking a bit longer because we're all on the machine, but that's okay. Um, so one thing I want to note here, uh, right, is where the packages are being restored to. So we, oh, this is slow. I might ask some of you to just kill your sessions at some point. So we can we can see our packages are being installed to this R library, right? So R um R env. This should be updating. Maybe it's in. What? Sorry, I think it's just taking its time. Iron Fedlock is the only thing, is the one thing that Iron needs. There is some stuff in here that's just amazing, like Iron installing itself. Like, how? I don't know. And it's just so cool. <laughs> Mo, I love how little chill you have. <laughs> Never change. So my colleague whose code is on GitHub needs to have been aware of Iron, but plain familiar repo won't follow the workflow just illustrated. No, Kevin, um, you can do it with a plain familiar repo in um, our studio. Like any repository um if there's an r project file it'll use the r project file associated with the repository so if that r proj is actually pushed to the repo so did we do that yet yeah so r proj if it's in the repo it'll use that and if it's not it'll create one so that would probably be the only difference um but you this could be anything it could be an image <laughs> and you could just pull pull it uh, clone it and open it up in our studio. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yes, but Eric and Mo, as Eric and Mo are saying, you need the rnv.lock to do the rnv part of this. You know, so if you just want to share code, by all means, like just clone and open it up as a project. Um, if you want to follow this RN workflow, then definitely um, we'll need to. Oh no, are we crashing? Cool. Failed. Oh, my heart is broken. I might ask all of you to just cease and desist on the VM. <laughs> Thanks, Mo. Please, everybody, kill your VM. <laughs> I made it a beefy one, but clearly not beefy enough. Oh, uh, um, Martin, just uh, log out. Yeah, sorry. Yes, so Eric's saying here, I should elaborate. The ideal situation in a multi-team environment is to have one person be the RN for admin. To prevent possible merge conflicts. Oh, our studio workbench is freaking out. Okay, babes. <laughs> um, yeah, we're gonna talk about that later. The top right corner looks like a power button. Mine completed with warnings, so Stephen. Okay. Do you want to post your warnings in the chat? Okay, I'm gonna try and log back in now. Sorry, this always happens with live demos. Spicy things go down. Oh no, it's freaking out. Oh. Let me try and get this session going again, a new session. If we all had multiple sessions running, that would be quite a lot of stuff. That's very true, Mo. Thanks for the, the thought. I think it was successful, though. Restarting interrupted promise evaluation. So I don't know a lot about promises in R, but um, I think it's when 
some you know something is supposed to appear and be populated at some point it seems like maybe that broke okay so <clears throat> i'm going to just open up my rn example again um RN project. i also just want to um quickly kill everything so i'm just gonna okay so this is important here you can actually quit these other sessions right so i'm just keeping the one going that i need to have going um so these will now not be using any resources on the machine okay i was quite ambitious with having everyone open so many sessions so i'm going to open my rn example dot proj so in that moment i just clicked on the dot r proj file and it's not opening up my session so that's cool and oh it wants me to restore so let's try that again yes while that's going i just want to make sure that i'm covering everything okay so i'm gonna just let this run now and hope that it doesn't die <laughs> again um it's gonna now i can after i've now installed basically restored this environment basically reinstalled or installed all of these packages i can run our um our snapshot again and that's going to grab all of that information and populate a, a lock file for me or edit the lock file for me right um so we're hopefully going to get to see that happen um but in case we don't maybe i can ask steve to run uh rn snapshot on his environment and he can copy and paste the first few lines of his log of his log file thanks steve okay so i'm going to just let this go and we're going to come back and see what steve has for us <laughs> and maybe mine will be alive again but let's go back to the slides okay what have we learned We've learned that the RN folder should not be shared between analyses at, or the contents of it anyway, and it isn't by default, right? So it's added to that .get ignore the contents of the RN folder. In this case, we didn't need the RN folder at all to reconstitute our analysis. We didn't need activate.r to reconstitute the analysis. We could do that just with the rnf.lock file. And RNF will actually create any missing files needed for a project when we run RNF activate. Ah, oh, nice, Steve. Okay, so Steve, can you post? I'm sorry, I'm calling you Stephen. Like I, Steve, like I know you, <laughs> Stephen. Um, can you please post the, let's say the up to the repository, any of the repositories, and then including like the first package entry. So like maybe the first like thirty lines of the of the RNF lock. And just open it up and, and paste that on the chat. That'd be cool. Okay, so snapshot captures the R version of your system. One moment, Sisty. Thank you. Um, and this is something to note. So what we have in our lock file, oh, it's dubious here. What we have in our lock file is the R version that was on the system that was used to create this lock file. What I wanted to demonstrate here but of course, technical issues, um, is that this updates to the R version that you're running. Aha, Steve just posted it in the chat. Nice. I'm just going to copy Steve's message onto my own screen so that I can pretend that I had this as a result. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to copy that much. so this is what steve got after he snapshotted after he ran restore and snapshot so here we get the r version um our repositories are the same and we have some information about the packages so this would have obviously continued for all of the packages right i didn't paste everything here 
Um, but what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that the R version changes because we're running R version 4.2.2. So just when you're creating these lock files and when you're snapshotting and updating projects um, after a long time, but also when you share with other people, um, obviously they should be aware, you should be aware that there are differences in our version, but just like highlight this as, as something, as a consideration. So this is updated now from 3.6.3 to 4.2.2. Right. Um, in in Posit Workbench, you can change the R version, like I mentioned earlier. So for example, if this code wasn't working, if we updated um, all the packages and it's like, or maybe there's some package that's stuck in R version three, um, you could downgrade your R version, just change the R version um, and, you know, try to run the analysis that way. So, you know, not all analyses need to have all of the packages updated to the latest version. You can also go back if you need to. I'm going to just kill this session as well. Uh, quit. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to close these ones as well. And rather than just, yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah, so snapshot captures our version and that's something to note when updating your remote repositories. Um, and I think Eric mentioned um, that in their organization, it's they have one person or you know a few people max. Um, yeah, he wrote, in the ideal situation, in a multi-team environment is to have one person be the RN for admin to prevent multiple, uh, possible merge conflicts with multiple users editing the lock file. Um, so yeah, a potential workflow could be like, I, as the dev, only work on specific files. I don't touch the lock file. When I'm done with my analysis, the last thing before we merge branches, you know, before we do get flow merge, um, pull request and merge is like, Eric comes in and just like runs update, uh, runs snapshot, you know? So it's his responsibility. No one else is allowed to touch that file. That's maybe a potential workflow. Okay, so where are the packages downloaded from? So by default, packages are downloaded from CRAN, like I mentioned earlier, um, but it's also possible to download packages from other locations. And why, like, why would you want to do that if CRAN is perfectly good? Um, like I mentioned, sometimes uh, people want these private uh, development environments. And I think this is especially true in the pharmaceutical industry where, um, you know, there's the, I think, um, that, you know, there's these sort of frameworks that dictate um, how validated environments should work. Um, and these environments, it's often it's a good idea to have them locked down so that they're not able to access the whole internet. And in that situation, you would have something like Posit Package Manager, like I showed you earlier. Um, for, your, for your organization that's not connected to, that's not accessible by um, the whole internet. And the packages that you download into your R Studio IDE are coming from an internally managed package repository where there's one person who's making sure that the correct packages are there and only validated ones. Um, so yeah, serving, oh, also like if you develop an internal package, um, you that isn't on CRAN, you know, um, you can also serve that to, to the people in your organization. Um, using these alternative package repositories. So if you are using, if you do have packages that are developed internally, like there's pretty much two options as far as I'm aware. One is Drat and one is um, Package Manager. And at Drumming Rivers, we use both. So we use Package Manager for our internally developed packages and only people in our organization are able to access those. Those are hosted on Puzzle Package Manager. And the ones that we use for our training are hosted on Drat, and those are publicly available um, to anyone. So that's what we're going to be using in the in the course today, if I can get this to work. Um, so how are these package repositories actually managed? Like I alluded to earlier that our repos are coming from the R profile that's managed at the organization level. Um, but there's other levels 
at which these default um, package repositories can be managed from. So the one is the rinf.lock. So the R can actually um, grab the repository straight from that lock file and not from any R profile. It's coming from the lock file. <coughs> Another way is a user level or a project level R profile. So on the user level, you would set your, your um, options, uh, your repos option like so um, to be a specific source. So for my, in my case, I'm running Jammy Ubuntu um, 2204 on my machine. And so there's a repository for Jammy packages on package manager. So I'm gonna download binaries from package manager by default rather than CRAN source packages. And so it's a qu bit quicker and more efficient, but yeah. So this is the line that you would put in your R profile um for the project level or the user level and then there's the r profile.site so this is a system-wide um especially if, well, only really if you're using a professional product uh positive product like workbench it's it's setting those parameters for all of the users um i added a little link here with more info on um repository management uh via the r profile um it's a, a blog post on the Posit website, which I think is helpful if you need more information about it. So managing repositories with RMV. Um, so the lock file captures that information about where these packages are downloaded from when Snapshot was originally called. So earlier I showed you the CRAN um, environment variable and the DRAT environment variable, and those are coming from those two repositories. Referring back to the last exercise, when we updated the snapshot, uh, the repositories did not update. So let me try and log back into the session. Um, is it gonna open up my project? Did I kill it too soon? Yeah, let's look at the RN quickly. Hot luck. So the original one had Jammy and JR training, right? And the one that Steve posted in the chat also had Jammy and JR training. So even though this machine um, has other repos configured for it, it didn't update this repositories section with the repos that it has on the machine. Editing these repos, where the packages is coming from, packages are coming from in this lock file is a manual process. That's not happening automatically. Um, RNV is not doing that automatically. And um, updating, yeah, so updating a repository requires manual intervention. And why? My guess, I I don't know. Like I'm I'm sure that there are reasons, but my um hypothesis is that it'd be really annoying when you're collaborating um with someone and they uh change the, the repository on you to whatever's on their machine you know so i'm using uh jammy uh ubuntu and you're using focal and then your your machine now goes and like downloads from jammy and you change it and then i'm trying to download things and like it becomes a mess so I think that's probably why, but I'm open to other hypotheses. Okay, so our next demo is to update a repository. I'm going to call for a break now because I want to just confirm that I can still do stuff. And if I can't do stuff on the VM, I'm going to just revert to my local R Studio installation. So I'm just going to ask for a 15 minute break just to give myself enough breathing room. So break until um what would that be uh, 57 uh, yeah seven minutes past the hour whatever the hour is for you oh yeah okay, i'm gonna just try and get set up on the side thanks for thank you all for uh bearing with me and my technical issues i really appreciate it cool see you guys in 15.
Okay, I've managed to get my local machine ready for action. But uh, let's see if I can get this to work on the VM as well. Yo, Mo and Eric are basically a teaching assistants right now. Thanks, guys, for jumping on the questions. Yeah, Mo. Um camera inside the environment what are you how are you setting that up are you using package manager positive package manager or are you using something else inside a container image oops Um, Mo says it's our IT syncs crying daily into the air gapped environment. I just got funding to test Pulse Package Manager next year, so I can put testing that. Awesome. Where can I access the Zoom recording slides afterwards? I might need to leave early. Um, I I'm not sure about the recording. Um, I will post the slides on the R on the R Medicine. Um page what is that page called sorry let me find it i will post them yeah ah here we go oh i'm gonna just pop this in the channel in the chat so uh after the course i'll just upload the slides over here and mo yeah dude like getting funding for nice things in academia is nigh impossible <laughs> I do think that Posit has different pricing for different institutions. I might be wrong though. I'm not the sales person. Yeah, they do. Nice. <laughs> Fortunately, in the industry, it can be challenging to get management to support new funding too. Yeah. I'd love to, uh, if anybody wants to post their Twitter in the chat, I'd love to like keep up with people doing interesting things. I'm gonna post mine. You can follow me. Um, uh, yeah, and if anyone wants to put theirs here, be cool to see what y'all are up to. Given the man hours, IT say on debugging our install issues inside an a gap environment, I think they save in the long run. Very true, V true. Um, 
yeah so while we're in the break I can like punt a few of Jumping River services <laughs> um yeah so we actually in the data engineering team we deploy and maintain a uh, package manager workbench and pos and posit connect which is a for those who might not know it's a uh platform to publish your analyses or your shiny apps or um, actually pin data that other people can use. It's sort of an all-in-one platform. Um, so we we maintain the Linux environment for these bits of infrastructure. Um, and we also uh, do the deployments and we have extra support time for people if they need. Uh, yeah, so we do deployments like both um, in a infrastructure as code way where we kind of gain access to virtual machines and just deploy our our infrastructure. And we also do remote deployment so we can support someone who's in IT through the installation process as well. I'm here, but I'm more here. <laughs> awesome. Oh, Eric has a podcast. That's cool. Tell us more about your podcast. Norway, the men hours are the highest cost. Interesting. It's an incredible podcast, Eric. <laughs> That's awesome. We have four minutes to advertise ourselves. So please tell us about your podcast. Mm. Oh, he has a few. Oh, are you the R Weekly podcast? <laughs> Shiny Dev series. Cool. Doing a live stream of Shiny Development at conference at this conference on Thursday. Nice. Weekly talk about one of my blog posts late last year. Well, that was fun. That is cool, dude. Um, it's like think about the most niche flex ever. <laughs> it's the most niche flex ever. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, sometimes jumping rivers uh blog posts feature on the um uh the R weekly page. And it's always like very exciting. But yeah, we do love a niche flex. Okay, let me see if I can get this to work on my machine. Um, Mo's talking about internal R packages on Friday. Should definitely head over to their talk. Awesome. <laughs> Jumping over is a re recurring contributor. It's fun. Um, Colin, our CTO slash founder. I'm sure lots of you know Colin. Um, he uh he says if you want to learn a new tech one of the really nice ways to do that is to write a blog post about it because then you get to explain it or give a talk on it yeah oh i love the bros getting together in in the <laughs> in the chat That's very cool. Okay, um, we have one minute of our break left. I'm going to share my screen so long. Okay, I'm going to do this one on my local machine to get around some of the issues. Um, cool, so we're going to do, we're basically going to edit our last um, project that we made, the RN example project. And in this theoretical situation, 
we are trying to use an internally developed package. So in this case, we're going to try and use a package called JR introduction. And this might totally bomb out. Let me just do something in the background here quickly while I still have a minute. No, I think we're good. The R guards are shining on me today. Awesome. Okay, so I think we're fine. And let's monitor the chat. <laughs> my blog is like me, unafraid to fail and show it. I love that, Mo. That's also my um my sort of uh, ethos around teaching as well. It's like, I don't know everything. I know some things and like we'll figure things out together if they fail. And then also to like engineer mistakes into your teaching material because then we get to learn together. Okay, so the thing we wanna do is in, like add a internally developed package into this code. So I'm just shifting over to my um, local R Studio environment because uh, technical issues and I don't want to crash this VM again. So I'm gonna move over there. But basically what we wanna do is go back to our RN for example uh, project that we made. And we're gonna add this um, package to the code called JR introduction. So I'm going to the code ggbizplot.r and here I'm gonna add library JR introduction. Oh, um, and I'm gonna save that. And now I've added this JR introduction to my um, machine, right? I've added it to my R file. And I'm gonna, again, just run status. So I'm coming back to my little anchor, my little blanky. <laughs> um, I also just, for my own illustration purposes, want to see what repos are going to be used in this project. Okay, so I use this function. This is a base R function, get option repos, right? So early in the slides, I showed you, um, that you can set options and you add these to your .r profile um, and these can include things like package repositories. So I wanted to just see what is actually available on this machine. And if I look here, I've got Jammy and I've got JR training. And if I look at the rinf.lock file, that's what I've got in the <clears throat> actual rinf.lock. And this rinf.lock, um, I snapshot at the end of demo two, right? So the in, uh, demo two ended off with us snapshotting this and recreating this rm.lock. And here I can see I've got Jammy and JR training listed, right? So I'm gonna try now to install my package from jumping over, so JR introduction. And you can try and install this as well. Um, it's a public package. It's not, I mean, it's internal, <laughs> but it's in a public repository. So it's not a secret. Um, so I'm just checking in RN in RNB, install, JR introduction, trying to install it. So it's looking for the package. It's loading, it's thinking, it's doing its thing. It's taking forever. <laughs> And I'm not even on the internet right now. Maybe the issue is my internet actually, which is entirely possible. If any of one has watched my live stream in the past, a lot of mishaps occur, both intentional and unintentional. Yeah. <laughs> oh, of course this is taking forever. 
I'm crying inside. Okay, it might be taking forever because it's supposed to fail. <laughs> it's taking forever to fail. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks, Shirley. Um, Shirley, if you want to post your error message in the chat, that would be great. Um, so I'm just going to kill this now because basically we know that this is not going to work. Oh, thanks. Um, so, right, this is not working. I'm going to stop and ours, oh, yes, terminate. Um, I'm going to now update this training uh, repository. This is our old training repository. We have now updated this training repository to something else. Um, and so this is not supposed to work. Uh, when you're updating a lock file, you don't want to just willy-nilly update these repositories like I mentioned earlier. This is the job of somebody who is administrating your RNV setup, like Eric alluded to earlier. Uh, Shelly gives this error. Error package CR introduction is not available. In addition, warning messages. Uh, the, UR, the requested URL returned error 404. So what that's saying is that that repository doesn't exist, right? It's giving a 404 message. So we're going to replace this um, in the in the rnf.lock file. So there are two ways to do this. You can just go straight up and edit this. I quite like the other way because I feel like it communicates the, um, the, the brevity, like the importance of what you're doing. <laughs> and that's using the rnv.modify um, function. Yes, and as Eric says, do not update this lock file in the editor manually, like if you can, like just rather um, rely on rnv to, automatically do this like the only times this is like the danger zone right this should be like in the red the only time you really want to do this is like when an old repository doesn't exist anymore and you need something new like it's not something that you want to do every day you don't want to go and magic uh, manually for example change the version numbers of your packages um unless you really desperately need to do that but i don't see why you would um right so i'm going to just grab the um new package repository so this is the new one over here in the comment so i'm going to copy that in and pop it into my url over here right i'm just replacing that i'm running save okay when you change a repository link um when you change any uh R, when you edit an r profile you need to restart R because R doesn't know that you've now gone and like changed the game. It doesn't know that you've shifted the ground underneath it. Um, you need to restart R so that it reloads that rinf.lock and, and R profile um, so that those changes can actually take effect. So I'm going to just go ahead and, and restart R. So you do this in case you don't know, session, restart R, and that restarts your R session. Okay, so it tells us the project is currently out of sync. RNV status for more details. RNV status. Right, I think it's just going to complain about JR introduction. Yeah, it's telling us the JR introduction is not installed. So now we can go ahead and install it. So RNV install. Oopsie. Um, JR introduction. And this should work now because we've updated the repo. But I'm not holding my breath because <laughs> technology is not um, cooperating with me today. Uh, once you've updated your repo, you can go ahead and try this command and let me know in the chat if it works. Cool. I have no idea why this is not working. Okay, so yeah, you can restart R, install the package as normal, and then notice where it installs from. So it's installing from this new repository, it should if it's going to install at all, who knows at this point. Can't you specify the repo in the rnv install command? That's a very good question. Um, uh, Alan, can you check the arguments of rnv install just by using the little help function in 
R and see if there's an argument. Session restart R is a good idea after installing packages. Yeah. Okay. So let's jump back in. So I had an exercise for you to do this on your own, but I think with time constraints, I'm gonna just press on. Um, but it's basically the same thing. You're just gonna update uh, the CRAN link to real CRAN and not um, the CRAN mirror that's on package manager. Um, yeah, so let's press on to the slides. Um, okay, so what we learned through doing this is that our packages come from multiple sources and not just CRAN. Site-wide settings dictate where packages will be installed from. And these pack these, um, you know, these options can also be set on the project level and the user level. The lock file can be edited, but proceed with caution. <laughs> and snapshot, snapshot, snapshot only captures the packages and the dependencies that are used in the project files. So if you install a package and don't use it, it has no effect on your um, on your lock file. And that lock file doesn't automatically change the um, repositories. So I have different repositories set on my local machine. It's not grabbing those. It's using what's in the lock file to install the packages. So the, the, um, the repositories that I have set on my machine in my um, R profile, that's you know my sort of global level R profile. Would it would have enabled me to download the the, the package, whereas because it's an isolated environment within Rinv, it's not taking cues from my R profile. It's using what's in that lock file. But if you don't, if if you create a new project, it grabs those repositories from your R profile. So it's a sort of interesting caveat. Um, so where are the packages downloaded to? So we've looked at where they're downloaded from, but where are they actually um, downloaded to? So normally to your um, own R OS R version folder. So on my computer, this would be home R, um, this like <laughs> uh, Linux new library and then R version 4.2. And then it would have my, all of my R packages actually now living in that folder on my computer. But with RN, does anybody want to guess where these packages are downloaded to? You can drop in the chat. Okay, no one's feeling bold. Oh. Okay, people are, are having their own chat in the background. So um, the packages aren't actually downloaded to your project level library. The, you know, I, show, I showed you that folder, rn slash library, and there's your packages. They're not actually downloaded to there. They're downloaded to a cache. And this cache is in a hidden folder. So denoted by the little dot. So it's in the cache. And then in R, R end, and then repository with all of the packages. And the packages that you actually see in your project are what are called symlinks to this cached repository. Um, so the reason for this is basically speed. So when I download a package for one project, it saves that package and its version in this cache. And if another project needs that same package, it pulls from the cached version. So from this common pool that sits between the two projects. So it doesn't go and ping package manager or ping the draft repo and grab the package again. It does it once and then it saves it in this cache. And then the, the project downloads the package from the cache. So it's pretty magical. <laughs> um, it, it makes installing packages a lot faster. So the next thing I want to do is clean up our project. I just wanted to explain a little bit about the background magic. I don't know why you are not working. I'm going to try and install dot packages for good measure and see if that works. Did anybody manage to install the package?
Yeah, I, this, of course, this is working beautifully. Yours is still running restore. Me going on about how fast this is. <laughs> Couldn't get it to install either. Oh, that's so annoying. And I see here that this is now modified, did not. Hmm. Let me try again. Have I activated our oh, here? Oh, I don't think I had it activated. <laughs> Let's see if that works now. Uh, okay, Stephen says he modified iron.lock directly. And now the package is installing. I, the iron modifier didn't edit the file. Strange. Okay, so if we directly edit it the way I just tried to, it should install. But alas. Anyway, you should likely snapshot after editing. Okay, let's try that. Snapshot. Yes. Okay. Let's restart our session for good measure. Right, are we in our RN? Let's check, looks like we are. Um, install, oh, let me just pick up. Sorry, I take it back. <laughs> yeah, okay, this is annoying. Um, Let's talk about cleaning up our project. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, okay, let's clean up our own example. Let's see if this will actually work in this. Um, uh, yes, let's try it. Let's try it on the VM. I live in hope. <laughs> I live in hope. Okay, I'm going to just add my repo to here and save that. And oh no, this was Steve's. Uh, let me close that. Okay. Um, I'm going to add a .r script here. Oh, I can do it here. Okay, so I've got my um. Oh, this is so annoying, right? Because I didn't manage to get this to restore at all. Let's see. Maybe since other people are not on the VM, it'll work. Oh, I think I made a mistake. <laughs> cool, thanks, Eric, for all your input. I really appreciate it. Cool. Um, yeah, that's... I'm just going to back away slowly from this. What I want to say is that we can use a function called clean. So if I have installed any um, packages here, so I'm going to install something that I know that I'm not going to need. So I'm going to install the parsnip um, package. So I know that I don't need parsnip in this project, right? Oh, I'm having issues with installing packages at all. That's so random. I'm going to try and install the, um, I'm going to try and install from CRAN rather. Uh, maybe it's this. Um,
Let me just add one more. Uh, 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 uh. I need to restart my session. Yeah. Our team is very slow. I think something is up, even the status, even though the status is saying it's okay. Yeah, I I think this is some bad luck. <laughs> But I'm also seeing Crown as being really slow. Trying to install from Crown. Installing Parsnip worked for Steve. Thank you, Steve. It was quick. Let me just close our studio and open it up again and see if that helps me. Yeah. Okay. Um, what I want to talk about is cleaning up your um, your orange project. So just pretend that I've installed some packages here that I don't need. I'm going to run orange clean. And so, ah, oh, this, this will actually work. Yay. Um, so I've got these packages installed. I mean, added to my um, my file, right? Um, I'm just going to add GG. I'm just going to keep GG this, right? So now I've saved my R file. Like I've saved my script. I'm basically I'm ready to like share this project, or I'm just on my own machine and I've got some packages hanging around that I don't need. We can use this RN clean function. And so what this does is it removes any packages that are not actually called in the code and are not captured in the lock file. So you might have installed a bunch of packages. So in, in your, in like the course of you developing an analysis, you start and you kind of move through and you try this library and then that doesn't really work. And then you try this one and that doesn't really work. And then finally you find the one that works and the workflow, you know, the, the, the pieces of the puzzle come together and you finish your analysis. But now you've got all these additional packages hanging around. The lock file does not capture those, which is great because that means that your um, collaborators are not gonna see all these random packages that they don't need. Um, so that information won't actually be captured in the lock file, but you might have like created a lock file and then snapshot it later, right? Um, whatever, like you, it's not gonna, it's not gonna actually end up being shared, but you might want to just remove some of these packages that you don't need. Um, and so you can use the clean function. So I'm going to just proceed and it's just quickly gone and removed all of those packages from the project library, which is awesome. Um, another one I wanted to share with you is um, install. So on my machine, I'm not sure if this is going to work, but I think I have used this in my package cache. Um, install, sorry, install. So use this as a really nice um, package, which enables you to uh, easily edit some of these files associated with projects. So there's a function called use this edit R environ and it edits your R environ file, your R profile. Um, but clearly I don't have it installed already in my package cache, which is annoying. Let's try it here actually, because apparently I like to look dangerously. Um, um, no, it won't be on this machine. Uh, okay. Anyway, um, you can quickly and easily download uh, functions, I mean, packages, if they're already in your cache. I just wanted to illustrate that. Uh, another um, one I wanted to show was Purge. So it's a pretty gross sounding uh, function. But if you have, um, 
a, a package that you want to get rid of in your cache as well as in the project itself. So there's a package that you know is not going to be used in anything else, or there's a version of that package that you don't want to have hanging around in your cache. You can also remove um, packages using this purge function. So I just wanted to touch on that as well. Um, let's see here what else I have for you in the handy functions. Um, yeah, and then update. So if you want to update your package packages, um, you can do that with RN as well. So this is really nice because you know you could, I mean, you could go to your packages and update them here. Um, but RN comes with a function to do this for you. I have no idea what is going on with my machine. Did anybody manage to try? Um, install or um, update. Ah, oh, you very likely have mass in your cache. Let's try that. Uh, Rinv install mass. I think it's my computer that's the problem. Yeah, because I, you know, I would have that on my. Oh. Annoying. Nicely, it's working nicely on your side. Awesome. Thanks, no. Oops. Okay. So when you want to update your packages, you can do that using update and it will update all of the packages that are associated with the project. So all of the packages that are captured in the lock file, which is also again really nice. Um Oh, it's, it, I'm very relieved that these things are working on your side. At least we can talk about it, even if it's not working on my side. Okay, let's head back to the slides. Um, so yeah, so like I mentioned, um, update, updates your packages, upgrade, updates RNV itself. So right now, I think we're running the latest version, but you know, that that the the management uh, of all of your packages, this this tool to manage your packages also updates, um, and so you can do that within projects as well, and it'll go and update the RN that's shipped with your, um, you know, uh, yeah, like when you open the project, that little RN install is going to update. Um, I yeah, I'm not sure about if update also upgrades RN. Um, that would be interesting to find out. Install installs packages for you, and diagnostics gets the full context of an RN project. So definitely go and run uh, diagnostics. Ah, oh, Mo, you're an angel. Cool. Mo just posts for us um, the output of RN in the chat. So yeah, so checks for packages to update, and it goes forth and updates those for you. Um, Mo. I don't think it automatically updates your lock file. Will you just check that for me and see if you need to run snapshot again? Um, I'm sure status will let you know either way. And yeah, if somebody wants to run diagnostics in and put the output, uh, maybe there's some secrets actually that might come in the output at your own <laughs> discretion. Um, Diagnostics can be also really useful because it shows you some of the, what are the environment variables are that you've established. Um, and status shows that the following packages are out of sync. sync. So there's a lock file version and library version. And then you can decide, do you want to update JSON Lite or do you want to go for the um, library version? So do you want to yeah, update or do you want to down, downgrade essentially yeah so iron like i find that the 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 messages that you get from the the tool are really helpful <laughs> uh, and yeah give you options okay so we have uh mo says that's brilliant because you might want to update test everything and then decide whether you want a snapshot or not. Exactly. 
Okay, so now I just kind of have a little bit of time at the end of this workshop for open discussion. Like, how do you envision RN fitting into your existing workflows? How will you manage collaboration? And how will you manage repositories? Um, you know, we've touched on a little bit of best practice around this. Um, like Eric mentioned, having one person who is the administrator of repositories and also um, the lock file itself um, can be really helpful. Uh, use this allows us to edit the environment. Yeah, let me show you. Um, let me see. Let me just deactivate this. Uh, um, deactivate. So use this. Use this. Uh, it. There are many functions within use this that I have not actually explored. For the most part, I use it for um, edit our environ. Oh. It's going to, okay, I'm not going to use this on my local machine because you'll see all my secrets. <laughs> my secrets will be splashed <laughs> across the across the internet. Okay, um, but I think my R profile, let me do this off, off of the screen share. My R profile should be safe. I think I, yeah, I removed any incriminating things from my R profile. Um, yeah, so my R profile is where I've set which um, repo I want my packages to come from. So this by default will be coming from package manager. My packages will be coming from package manager by default uh, and the Jammy Linux install. Um, but yeah, edit our environ is also great. Um, so for example, I use GitLab. GitLab is the tool that we use to manage our code repositories. Um, and so I've got um, an access token for GitLab stored in my environment file, my R environment file, and, and that's what I'm able to use to access some of the data on GitLab, for example. Uh, also like API tokens, so the Clockify API, um, you know, we have some packages internally that enable us to uh, look at um, time tracking data, and so that basically my machine is connecting to the Clockify um, website, Simply, simply put, and pulling that data in. But you, because that data is confidential, you need a like a password to do that. So yeah, right, editing your R environment is useful for that. Um, my question may have been lost in the past. In the package, will R install use this update the description file? I don't think so. Uh, you'll need use this use package package for that, but I'll not install the package. You don't want Sue Sue rent <laughs> to Sue R and B in a package development project. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to use R R and B in package dev. Yeah, I don't think that that's a good idea. I think it's it's really built for things like analysis. Um. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So my question is, how do you, like, can you immediately see the value of RN for your own workflows? I, it's unfortunate <laughs> that my demos didn't work, but I'm hoping that some of you who, who ran the code were able to see the, the benefit. I know Mo was. Um, yeah. Uh, has anyone used RM in standalone R scripts rather than projects? I know that's a bit weird, but sometimes people have quick and dirty scripts to run essentially only once and then they realize later that they need to run it again. Alan, that is literally why projects exist. <laughs> as far as I know, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure projects and RM go together. I don't think you can separate the two, but I stand to be corrected on that. Um, you want dev tools and use this for package dev? where every package your package needs is in the description and ID not locked to a version and is not locked to a version, I'm assuming. Yeah, nice. Um, yeah, in terms of um, managing collaboration, I think that the suggestion I made earlier of, you know, updating the rnf.lock being the last um, kind of 
action before an analysis is considered like productionized is probably a good way to go about it obviously like if you are collaborating with somebody and you're going back and forth and you know pushing your changes you can also push your lock file um but as a sort of routine last step i think it would be a good thing i definitely see the use of rnv but will struggle teaching it to users because of the use of it is so different than what people are used to that's so true i think also if you're not in industry getting people to use git is already quite a stretch stretch martine says you typed rn well done mo <laughs> two and a half hours in and mo's got it <laughs> that's great um yeah i think i think that's definitely uh, i think there's a learning curve for sure um yeah um but i think maybe organizationally having somebody be a champion for a new tech that's all the other people can refer to I find that um, having a person who makes a new tech piece of technology like approachable and workable um, is helpful for that. When I've tried teaching it to the lab, albeit badly, since I didn't really get a lot of the things myself, will be better now. Like they're mystified about this concept of running something outside the script. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm glad that it's it's a more uh, less opaque for you now, Mo. That's very helpful. Thank you for that. Okay, and then managing repositories. I think um, repository management is a whole demon on its own thing. So, like having a package manager is just really helpful. Um, for restricting, I guess, what users are and aren't able to install on their machines. Um, it's basically built for that. Uh, I think if you don't need a lockdown environment, it's a lot simpler, really. Um, I think just making sure that the same person who's maybe reviewing the code for the lock file is the person who also like keeps the repositories um, maintained. I would say. I've been doing RN for then hitting escape to keep RN. <laughs> nice. Okay. Before I let you go, um, here are some bits of info about us. So Jumping Rivers is consultancy, like I mentioned earlier. We have data science consultants. Um, we have trainers who teach all sorts of things. And we have the infrastructure data engineering side. Um, and often our projects kind of straddle all of these um, categories, you know, like sometimes people need help with bits of everything. Um, so, you know, if you need help with something related to data and infrastructure and Linux and R and Python, we can help. Um, yeah, these are the people to contact. And if you want to keep in touch with me, oh, my last slide, that's not working. I popped my um, Twitter in the chat and I'll also just pop my email address. Data Chino is me on Twitter and I'm Astrid at jumpingrivers.com. If you have any questions or feedback for me following this workshop, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, also, if you are um, a woman in R or a sort of underrepresented person in R, uh, you know, in the community and you just need like some guidance or help or input, um, also please like get in touch with me. I love meeting other people uh, who are looking for support. Okay. Um, I'm going to post the slides here um, later on. I need to render them to PDF and then I'll pop them in this place over here. And if you're on Git and use GitHub, GitHub has something called code owners file, which is great. Yes. So yeah. Um, Exactly. So you can have multiple people working on the same project um, and those permissions are managed. Yeah, in GitHub. Uh, 
or GitLab or Bitbucket, whatever you're working with. Oh, Martin, you're welcome. Thank you for the feedback. Um, I'm glad that it's starting to compute. That's awesome. That's great to know. I'm so sorry that my all my demos just crashed and burned towards the end. Um, yeah, cool. You guys are so welcome. Thank you. And please do follow me on Twitter so I can make new friends. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Live coding is terrifying for this reason. Yeah, um, I've done enough training at this point that I'm like hardened. It's just weird when it happens because it's inexplicable sometimes. Brittany, thank you, Brittany. Awesome. Yay, I really think that um, especially for like pharmacometrics and um, yeah, you know, epidemiology and these fields where it's really important that your environment is sort of as standardized and replicable as possible. Um, it's really important. Alan, the recording will probably be posted by the R Consortium. And I think it will probably appear on the same page where the slides will appear. I hope. That is my hope. Yay, that's great, Todd. Awesome. Sick. OK, guys, I'm going to call it there. Thank you so much for joining me. And um, I'll see you on the internet. Uh, I might be able to pop into a few of these talks. Um, yeah, thank you. Oh, thanks. Thanks for being a great chat, guys. Very lively chat. I really appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Keep well, everybody. Have a good evening and have a great conference. I know this is just day one. And really take the opportunity to connect with other humans doing cool things, even though it's all virtual and weird. <laughs> cool. Okay, guys. Bye.